<laughs> What's going on, everybody? Here we are for another Q&A session. And you know how I feel about Q&A day. It is so much fun. Now, there's a couple things I want to first get caught up with. Some of you have been asking, how is the map coming? So I decided to pull it back out, and it is filling in nicely. I've had several editions. Now, if you send something in and I did not mark it off, send me a message in the comments. I don't want to miss those. I want to accurately fill it in. I've been pretty good, pretty diligent about it, but I've added, oh, maybe five or so states in the last couple of weeks. So that's very cool. So that's where we stand. And included in those recent uh, packages, my guy Philip sent me some really cool stuff. These are from the J Publishing. They're the photo packs. And he sent me the photo pack from, this is the one from 1960, the team set. Now you could mail through, uh, you could go through the mail to get these. You could get these at the stadium. This would be the first year that Willie McCovey was included. So that would be the first Willie McCovey one. And then you can see, you know, it's got the whole giant team set, Willie Mays. I mean, very, very cool. And then the 60s set as well. So this one has Juan Marichal. The first Juan Marichal, you know, his rookie card is 61. And then it has the 61 of Willie Mays. And he was really cool because he sent some literature about it so I could learn about them a little bit more. Very cool gift. And then he threw in a couple Clemens cards. You know I'm going to like those. So you got this cool Clemens. And then the rookie of the goat right there, my guy. So, Philip, thank you so much for those. Now, if you're kind of new to this whole thing, if you're interested in participating in Q&A Day, remember, down in the comments below, simply type in your question and I'd be happy to answer it. If I don't get to it this week, ask it again the following week and it'll move to the top of the list. I wanna answer all the questions. Uh, this week, I think we had eight or nine submitted and I like to choose five, um, but please don't hesitate. If you've never sent in a question, please seriously send in a question. It's so much fun to hear from everybody, especially the people that I've not heard from before. Now, I do have a couple of things that I want to share. First, remember, the deadline is coming up in about a week and a half on April 19th if you want your favorite pickup from March to be included in the community show and tell, the community slideshow of everybody's favorite pickup. Down in the description below, there's a link. It's a Google form. It'll ask you a couple of questions like your name and then give you a spot to upload your submission for the month if you want to include your favorite pickup from March into the community slideshow. And I have kind of something I'm really, really excited to share with you guys. I completely pulled an audible and I'm going to Strongsville. I'm going to the Strongsville show. I, I mean... And, and I, I texted a couple of people this weekend, and I'm like, I think I'm going. And they were like, are you serious? And now, I, and I bought my tickets. I'm in. So I got my hotel. I got my flight. I got a, a friend is going to help me out with transportation. I'm going to Strongsville. And believe it or not, that's in a week and a half. Now, this is completely out of character for me. I am the guy who plans things out six months in advance. But I will be at Strongsville in a week and a half. How did that unfold? I don't even really know how to describe it. I just finally said, you know what? I'm going. And here I am. I'm going. So if you're going to Strongsville, look for me. Come say hello if you see me. I'd love to meet everybody. I am really excited. Okay. All of that news. And let's go ahead and talk about our first question for this week right here. I was going through adding eBay comp prices to my tier one and two want list. I noticed that highest sale price for each of the cards on my list were sold by the same few sellers. Many of the examples were more than twice the price of the next highest example. Most of these sellers have higher shipping prices as well. This makes no sense to me. Why would anyone pay a premium on a card based on who the seller is? I'd like to hear your thoughts on this subject. 
All right, so this is a great question, kind of a complicated question. It, you know, it, it's, I don't think there's one thing that leads to this, and I don't think that this is always the case, but let's, let's talk about a few of the things that could lead to a couple of the sellers continually having really high price stuff. For example, there's one dealer in my area that when you go to his table, everything is really, really well-centered. He only buys stuff that's really, really well-centered. And we all know that centering has a premium. I feel like he buys undergraded stuff. So all of his stuff is really high-end for the grade versus some, you know, things are not high-end for the grade. So part of it might have to do with those sellers are maybe buying and then selling things that are really high-end for the grade, really high-end eye appeal, really high-end centering, and that might be part of it. But there might be a couple of other things too. So let's take a look. I wanna actually use an example. I don't wanna just talk about this situation. I wanna actually look at a couple of cards that sold recently to help answer this question. So let's look here. All right, so we've got the card on the left and the card to the right. Same card, same grade, same grader. The one on the left sold for $350, the one on the right for $255. Centering is even very similar. Now you can see that the one on the right is a darker scan, so the color brightness on the left doesn't really affect me much because I just know that it's a darker image. So you're like, well, why would this one be selling for such a different price? I mean, we're talking a significantly higher price for one, the one on the left, and they're the same grade. So is it the seller? Is it something else? Well, let's take a closer look here. So the one on the left, you can see, first of all, it was a buy it now. The one on the right was an auction. So one of the issues might be that some of these sellers are just doing buy it nows, so they're not doing auctions. And by doing buy it nows, so they're just kind of being patient and holding out for an impatient buyer who loves that copy and is willing to pay up for it. But the other thing, if you look at the bottom, the one on the left accepts returns. The one on the right does not. Now, when you're buying a card online, it is very, very realistic that once you get it in your hands, you go, oh, I didn't see that. I didn't see that either. So when a card has returns, that's one of the first things I look for when I'm talking about thinking about making a big purchase for a card online is do they accept returns? Because I have had times where I'm like, I think I like this card, but there's this little thing there I'm not sure about. And I ended up having to return it. So it's certainly possible that, that they just buy and sell high-end stuff, right? It's possible that maybe uh, the cards in question are cards that w maybe that seller just sells stuff by it now and they're just patient, right? Because auctions tend to sell for less. Auctions really tell us where the price point is of what the card's going for because it means that two people are willing to pay that amount for that card. When you have a buy it now, it might just be somebody with deep pockets who's impatient and wants the card right now and says, you know what, I'm just gonna go for it. And they'll pay maybe over comps or maybe those buy it nows are better than the auction cards. But generally speaking, if you wanna know what the going rate is for cards, I wouldn't look at the recent comps, I would look at the recent auction comps. To me, that's a more telling sign. So if you're in the market for a card, right? And even if the card in front of you is not the card that you want, you should be tracking what the auctions are going for, especially for the cards that aren't coming up as much. You know, a friend of mine, we're talking, we were talking this weekend and we were talking about there was a big card that was up for sale and it was, you know, an auction and they don't come up at auction very often. They're usually buy it nows. And it's like, oh, this is a really good opportunity to see what this card is actually selling for. It's like a science project, right? It, it's like your model of your house selling three doors down on the same side of the street, the same busyness street, and it just went up for sale and you're gonna see what it goes for. Now you really have a pretty good idea of what your house is probably worth. So 
it could be that, you know, it's auctions versus buy it nows, being patient. It could be I appeal. Another thing that is going to come up in a few minutes with one of the other questions is a lot of the times, a lot of these big auction houses, a lot of these big consigners have hundreds or thousands and thousands of followers to all of their items that hit the market. When you are putting your card up for consignment with, you know, Comp C or you're putting it up, well, they usually do buy it nows more, but if you do it through Four Sharp Corners, if you do it through GMC, if you do it through Probstein, those companies tend to have a lot of followers and those followers are subscribed to everything that hits the market from them. So you're going to get more eyes. Some cards that are just listed by regular old guy like me falls through the cracks. And one of the reasons it falls through the cracks is because it doesn't have this built-in audience. So, you know, and again, we're going to talk about this again in a second uh, uh, when with one of the other questions. So I don't want to get too far into it. But there, there definitely could be several factors all working at once as to why some sellers are getting more. But, but noting that and keeping track of that is something to know, especially if you're thinking about selling something. What is your negotiation strategy when you're buying cards? Do you have a standard percentage that you ask off of the asking price? Or does asking price not influence your offer at all? Does your strategy depend on if you're making the offer in person at a show or at a card shop or making it online? Okay, this is a fun question. Nobody knows the best way to negotiate. We all have strategies. I mean, I was a marketing major and I had a sales class. So in college, we literally just learned how to, how to sell stuff and different sales techniques. When it comes to cards, for me personally, I think that there's one key thing. One key thing when, when doing a negotiation with a seller, especially when we're at a show. Now it could also work online, but especially if there's a card at a show, because personally, I would rather buy a card at a show or a shop because sales tax is suddenly not an issue. And when you live in a state like mine, where sales tax is like eight and a half percent, you know, on a thousand dollar card, that's 85 bucks. So if you're going to buy an expensive car, it absolutely matters if you're buying it online or you, the other thing is, is at a show, you get to see it in person. You get a much better look at it. So I prefer to buy at shows and at shops, but I also know that it's sometimes looking for a needle in a haystack to find the card that I want. But that's not your question. Your question is, Greg, you find the card you like, you, you see the dealer, you go up, you ask to look at the card. What's your negotiation strategy? Now, for me, the number one strategy, the number one thing that I would recommend is don't say your number first. Make them say their number first. And you can say that in a, in a bunch of different ways. You know, if, if they've got a $100 price tag on the card and you say, hey, will you take 90 for it? Well, they might have offered 80. So you going straight to 90? That, that maybe cost you some money. So if you can get them to move. Now, so I try to get them, I say, hey, here's a card. I'm interested in this card. What's the best you can do on this card? And then they say, well, what are you thinking? And I go, well, I mean, I've seen the card around and I, I, you know, I'm interested in this one, but it, it kind of depends on what your best is. They... If, if they are uh, strategic, they're going to try to get you to say your number first. So what I've heard a lot of dealers say is they'll come back and they'll say, well, you know, I've got a price tag on it. My price tag, I'm asking 100 So that's, that's what I'm asking. And then I usually would come back with, okay, I see that you're asking 100 but is, is that your best? Is 100 your best? And I'd really try to get them to move first. Now, hopefully they move to a point that's lower than I would have offered, right? The second thing that I would recommend is once they say, my, yes, this is my best, 
Then you kind of look it over, you kind of think it over, and then you say, so say they come back and they say, 80 is my best. You go, okay. And then you say, so 80 is your, your best? It's your absolute best? There's no more room in it? And they'll say, yes, I said 80 is my best. Or they'll say, uh, well, what are you thinking? And if they say, what are you thinking? That means 80 is not their best. <laughs> if they say, well, what's your offer? Then that means 80 is not their best. So I usually try to get them to say a number first. Hopefully it's less than what I would have offered. And then I try to come at them again and see if they can negotiate against themselves and come down even more. I usually won't offer below their best if they say, no, 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 80 is my absolute best. I'm not going to go, so 75? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to honor the fact that they said, no, 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 that's my best. So that's the one thing for me is once you ask for their best, if they give you their best and they say, no, 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 that is my best, I, I won't offer under that. To me, that's kind of disrespectful for me. Doesn't mean it is, just for me, that's how I negotiate. Now, if they absolutely won't come off their price, you know, and they just make me say a number first, I would probably, you know, I would probably start with what I'd like to get for it, you know? So the card's a $100 card, they won't say their number, I'm hoping to get it for 80, and, you know, uh, I, might, I might say something like, you know, I. I'd like to get it for somewhere, you know, 70, seven. And then I'm reading their face really closely and they're like, you know, it, depending on their face, re facial reaction, I'm going to adjust a little bit, but I'm going to, I mean, man, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to get it for like 70, you know, uh, or seven. And then they, their face is disgusted. I say, or 75 or something like that. You know, that's kind of how I do it. But I try to make them move first. So to me, rule number one is try to get them to negotiate against themselves by lowering their price before you even throw a number out. Because a lot of the times they're going to throw a number out that's lower than maybe what you would have offered. Um, if they say my stickers are my price, I don't come off of the price, then I have to decide at that point, you know, if I still want to offer or if I just do just want to pay it. Have I paid sticker? Absolutely. Have I paid over comp on cards? Absolutely. Um, have I? Do I always try to get it for as cheap as I can? Of course. I think we all do because the cheaper we get it for, the more dollars we have to spend elsewhere at the show, on our collection, online, or wherever it is. What, in your opinion, would be the best avenue in which to sell your cards that we get you the most looks that charge the smallest selling fees? So a lot of us, the most commonly transacted place for trading cards is eBay. So I want to show you a couple of things and then we'll talk about this a little bit more. eBay charges 13.25% on every transaction for trading cards up to $7,500. And then the rate goes way down to 2.35% on everything above $7,500. But some people like to go through a consigner because they don't want to deal with it. Well, GMC is a very well-known, recognizable consigner, and they charge 25% plus a 50 cent uh, surcharge. And, and you can see the details there. But some people just want to send it in, not deal with it. One option would be GMC. And again, it's popular for raw cards. Another option, which is for slab cards, most likely, are four sharp corners, and you can see their breakdown, you know, 10% for under $25 plus a $2 fee, you know, goes all the way up to 5% for cards over $1,000. And there are others, right? There's Com C, there's Probstein. There are a lot of different options if you just want to send it off. So let's go ahead and talk about this. So, this, you know, this is, this is really kind of a tough one, but you know, just like I said a minute ago, and just like I mentioned before in the video, you know, some of the selling platforms have a built-in audience. Thousands and thousands of extra eyes are going to see your listings if they're with some of the big auction houses because of how many people have those, those saved sellers in their eBay listing. Plus, your time has value. So you have to decide, 
is it worth my time? Yes, I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm listing this $100 card and it's gonna take me, you know, or I'm listing $500 cards and it's gonna take me 30 minutes to list them. And I'm gonna make an extra, you know, I don't know, uh, $7 a card or $10 a card or something if I have to deal with it. And, but if I send it off, to you know, Greg Morris cards, or I send it off to Four Sharp Corners, or I send it off to Com C, or wherever it is. You know, you're just done with it. You don't have to do anything. You just mail it off, and then they pack it up, they ship it, they take care of it, they list it, they take good pictures. You know, it's like a a, a good a, a good accountant, and we're in tax season, right? A good accountant pays for themselves. A good accountant, let's say they charge. I mean, there could be a wide range depending on your situation. But let's say your accountant charges $300. A good accountant will save you more than $300 on your taxes than doing it yourself. So not only do you not have to do it yourself, but you can make sure that it's done right. And by spending $300, they might save you $500. So you're actually a net up five or $200 because they cost you 300 but you got an extra 500 Same thing with a real estate agent. You know, a real estate agent, it, it, they get, make good money. But a good real estate agent, ideally, would make enough extra in the marketing of the house with their connections, with their buyer base, to pay for themselves. So that's something that you have to consider when you're trying to grind out a few extra dollars in your uh, selling of your cards. Quite frankly, I'm frustrated with selling cards right now. I feel like, you know, eBay's getting 13%. And then when you buy, you know, I've got to pay sales tax of 8.5%. So just right off the top, right off the top, if I buy a card and then I sell the same card, I need the card to go up 25% to break even. Then on top of that, the government is, is taxing, you know, and, and I'm not going to get into this whole government thing, but the government is trying to bring down the tax, you know, how, what, what amount you can make to get tax paperwork. And people say, well, you got to pay your taxes. And I'm, I'm not talking about paying my taxes. What I'm talking about is if I bought a card 10 years ago for my collection and I decided to sell it now, I decided to sell it now, and I now sell it, and now it's an expensive card, and, and I now hit the threshold running it tax paperwork, but I'm just going to basically transfer my money from this card into this card. I, I'm, I'm not running a business. You know, now, a, flippers are a completely different thing, but us collectors, us hobbyists, how many times are you going to tax the same card? You taxed it, you know, out of the pack. You taxed it when it sold in the card shop. You taxed it on eBay when the guy who bought it at the card shop ended up selling it. I mean, that same card get, could get transacted 10 times and they tax it 10 stinking times. It's more than the value of the card. And then I have to keep track of it. And then my taxes are complicated. It's so frustrating right now to just be a hobbyist. I'm not trying to get rich. I'm just trying to have fun. And there are times that I have a card that I'm like, you know, I don't want that card anymore. I want this card anymore. And now I got to worry about my taxes because I sold this card for this card. I basically did a trade, but it went to cash and then the cash to the card. It's really, really frustrating. And, and you know, I could go off. I guess that might be a, that might have been a mini tangent, right? But I could go off on a pretty big tangent about this. They're absolutely bleeding us. All we want to do is collect rectangular pictures of athletes with stats on them. And you're making our taxes insane. So I don't know how I got there. Greg, you're crazy. Probably so. But the point to your question is, how do you bleed out the extra money? It just kind of depends. To me... You could do the Facebook marketplace thing. You could do the Instagram thing. Have I ever done those before? A little bit. You could do the Net54 thing. 
You could do these other options. You could set up at a show, which I'm going to do in a couple of weeks. I don't have much to sell, but I'm going to hang out at a card show for a couple of days. What's the best option? I don't think that there's a great option, but I don't think that there's one option that's clearly awful. So I wish that I could give you a great answer, but I don't know that I can because I'm frustrated right now. And I think a lot of us in the hobby right now are very, very frustrated with, I've got some cards that I know somebody else would like, but it's a pain to sell them. And then I'm going to get all this tax paperwork and I'm going to have to try to figure out what the basis price was, what I sold it for versus what I got for it when I sold it. And then I got to I got to pay taxes on it when I bought it. I got to pay eBay when I sell it. And then I got to pay taxes on the profit. It's a tough time to try to grind it out as just a collector. So I would say a Comp C, uh, a, a consigner, an eBay. It is what it is, I guess. And just see what you can do. I realize you're having a blast pursuing some glorious pre-war cards for your collection. However, are there any modern baseball cards, even if you never end up collecting them, that are calling to you and hence have been vying for your collection attention? If you've already answered this one in the past, oops. So if you're not a subscriber of my friend Adam from A Vintage Sanctuary, uh, check out his channel. Great channel, great guy, really great videos, good energy, a lot of fun, great collection. He has a great eye for cards. In fact, he and I are kind of been playing phone tag a little bit, trying to work out, find a date, time. I'm going to have him on the show, and I'm going to ask him some questions to so look forward to that. But to the question, Adam, um, it's a tough one. There, there are two topics that I feel like half the audience – completely agrees with me and half the audience wants to throw rotten fruit at me and one of those topics is whenever we talk about restoration of cards right altering cards kurt's card care that is a topic that some people get absolutely irate at you regardless of which side you're on and another topic that is that way is when you talk about modern cards some people think modern cards are the only way. Some people think modern are just as great as vintage. And some people think vintage are great and modern are trash. There are three real camps. And, and regardless of how this question is answered, it's one where I will be dodging fruit for sure because um, it will definitely anger someone. Now, historically speaking... Um, whenever I buy any modern cards, it's purely for entertainment purposes like opening the packs or the, the blaster or whatever. And for, you know, I want to have a few cards of current players that I like. When, for, as far as like investment or like expecting it to appreciate in value... That's not something that I've really gone towards. So uh, could those things go up in value? Of course. Could they be beanie babies in 20 years? Of course. Um, what do I think? Now, but that wasn't really your question. <laughs> your question was, are there any that I'm after? Um, well, in my recent pickup video, I did pick up a fairly modern card. I picked up that... Derek Jeter card that has the mantle and George Bush airbrushed into the back. Um, just that card is like a special card for me. I know that card also comes in gold. I'd love to have a gold copy of it where it's numbered out of the year. Um, that's a card I would definitely be interested in. I do have some modern cards, right? I have quite a few Matt Mannings. I, you know, for my former student and I, I have... Uh, several of his first Bowmans and a variety of different parallels that are signed. Um, I tend to, I, I went to a, a, 
a smaller Division I school. And so every few years, uh, a good baseball player comes through or football player comes through. And so I tend to collect their cards. So there was, um, you know, Brooks Lee uh, is in the Twins system. I have a few Brooks Lee cards. He was actually named after Brooks Robinson. And again, I went to Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. And then uh, there is another guy that was drafted uh, who's Drew Thorpe, and he was part of the trade for Juan Soto uh, with the Yankees. He went over to San Diego, and then he went from San Diego over to the White Sox. So I have a few Drew Thorpe cards. Um, for the most part, I'm not really into that. Now, I know there are a lot of us out there, a lot of us vintage collectors who really like the, you know, sparkly, um, shimmery cards with the vintage players. And Adam in particular has some. He's got, he shows them, he's shown them recently. I just watched a video yesterday or the day before where you had some really cool looking, um, like chrome, uh, Willie Mays cards. And they were, they're beautiful cards. And they're, I, they're numbered. And I, they are beautiful cards. Um, what will happen with their values? It's impossible to know because ultimately the price of things is completely dependent, well, not completely, but largely dependent on the demand for something. There are a lot of rare things that are also worthless, but then there are some rare things that are really expensive. And ultimately it depends on the demand for the item. So if enough vintage collectors, and there's a lot of them, there's a lot of people out there I've seen pick these up. You know, my buddy Dylan at Double D Vintage Baseball Cards collects them. Uh, Shoebox Legends has some that he's shown. He showed some Satchel Pages the other day, another great channel. You know, so there are people that are into them. And if enough people are into them, they could have quite a market. Um, when I buy cards, if I'm paying a fairly significant amount of money, and when I say significant amount, for me, anything over about 50 bucks is fairly significant. I, will, I, I hope that it also has some holding value, some upward mobility potential. And those cards, though, though I think they're cool, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not convinced yet that they're going to go up. Now, they could 10x. They could become very popular. Or they could be Beanie Babies. I have no idea. Um, so because of the price point that they're at, they're kind of not really my thing. I would rather instead of buying, you know, three Roberto Clemente chrome mini diamond, you know, magic dust cards, I would rather just take that, you know, for me, 250 or $300 and, you know, buy, I don't know, a, a Bill Dickey 33 Gaudi something like that. Now, that doesn't mean I'm right and those people are wrong. It's just a preference thing. And that's the part about the hobby that I love the most. You know, I have my buddy Darren from Return to Collecting on, uh, you know, just a few days ago. And, and we are shopping in different department stores. You know, I am hanging out in Walmart. Um, in fact, I bought a pair of jeans from Walmart this weekend, like literally. Literally, I think they were like 25 bucks. I don't think Darren's buying his jeans there. And that's cool because Darren and I can still be buddies. We can still be shoulder to shoulder at the card show. We can still have lunch together at the card show. We can still send each other pictures of the cards. It's just like golf. And I've said this before. The thing about golf is you don't have to be of equal quality of the two golfers. You don't have to be anywhere near the same handicap to go out on the golf course together and have a great time. It's just two guys hanging out. And so if you're into modern and I'm into vintage, if you're into, you know, all time greats in modern cards and, and that's just not my cup of tea, we can still coexist in the hobby and think that, hey, great pickup. I loved seeing your cards. I love seeing those Willie Mays cards the other day. I think they're gorgeous. I just would rather spend my $100 on something else. And that's totally okay. And that's totally cool. So I don't know if I answered your question, but those are my thoughts 
as I'm responding. How do you organize your collection? I'm sure if you collect any sets, or I am building a 1973 set, all of my commons are in a binder, with the exception of cards that are valued over a dollar. Why a dollar? Because anything else I have collected over the years, with this value I have always put in a top loader. The bad part is, is what do I do with those top loader cards? I have them in boxes, but how about graded cards? Mixed up in top loaders? I feel very unorganized because I have cards all from the same set, but not together. So this is a great question. You know, people have asked this question before. I haven't really gone into depth in this yet. So I figured, you know what? Let me show you guys around my little card room. Um, I'm going to show you some of the stuff I have. There's actually a pickup in there that I've not shared with you guys yet that I'm really excited to show you. Um, and I think that I think that it's just time to kind of show you how I organize stuff, show you a little bit more of my collection. So here we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and take some footage through my card room, show you kind of how I organize things, not show you all my cards, but show you some of my cards and some of my sets and some of the way that I keep things organized and some of the things I have on the wall that surround me as I'm in that room. Let's check it out. All right, so here's one of my cases. This is got a bunch of my cooler T206 cards, my Yankee captains up top, second row are Hall of Famers, except for Ginger Beaumont. Third row's all Hall of Famers. Fourth row, I have a bunch of my golf cards, some sport kings and stuff and then on the bottom some others now this was cool these are my tickets to the u.s open when tiger won in a playoff that double fist pump day i was in the grandstands and that was a picture from jim fitzpatrick more on him on just a second here's my jack nicholas autograph here are a couple of special cards that friends have sent to me that i have on displays and then Right down here, I've got some boxes with cards. I've got some of my binders with cards. We'll take a look inside of those here in just a second. And then some of my cases and some of my supplies and stuff down there. So this is Jim Fitzpatrick. He is an artist who does mostly golf art. And I'm gonna show you a couple of very special things that I have that he did. He is pretty much world-renowned. He's a big-time artist in the golfing community. Well, when I turned 40 years old, my mom commissioned him to do a painting of me and my daughter. So that's me and Molly high-fiving. That was at a uh, parent-child uh, tournament that we won. There's me and Lucy on the left, and then the, two, the three of us in the middle there. So my mom commissioned him to do that. And I'm a big fan of his. And I recently picked this up. This is hand sign. This is pencil. This is an original from Jim Fitzpatrick of Babe Ruth. That is a pencil sketch. Those are all individual little lines. And that is really, really cool. I picked that up a few months ago. He's closing down his art studio, and so that was an opportunity for me to get an insane deal. So my sets, here's my 79 top set. I have the wrapper in the front. My entire 79 top set is in this binder. So, I mean, you can see Steve Carlton there at the bottom. I didn't pull in, there's a Paul Molidor. There's, I didn't pull anything out. Every single card is in there. This set was hand put together. I did about half of it, and then my dad finished it for me. Oh, this is probably 30 years ago. Um, it's a really, really sharp set. If I were to get these graded, I, I can't imagine any of these getting below an 8. Um, it's a really high-end set. There is Robin Yount in the center. Now, coming up here, you're going to see the big page. There they are. It's so crazy that the Nolan Ryan and the Ozzy Smith are side by side in the numbers. So they're side by side in the pages here. So I have the entire set 
in Binder still. Now, these are all gifts from all of you. So you can see on the back there, I have names of who sent me the cards. These are a bunch of Greg Nettles cards. So I have these by player. So I have a bunch of Nettles cards. And then you'll see as we keep moving. Again, every single one of the cards in this particular binder was sent from you guys. I got my Matt Manning page. Again, you can see names on the back there of who sent me the cards. And so this is a super special binder to me. So again, more Mannings, and then I get into the Clemens, and then by Clemens, what I did is I did them by team. So these are all Red Sox Clemens cards, more Red Sox Clemens cards. And then I did it where I think next is the, the Yankees, and then I have the Blue Jays, and then I have the Astros. So I kind of have it by player, and then if the player is on more than one team, it's by team after that. Again, more Clemens. These are all Red Sox Clemens. And then you can see there's some Blue Jays, some Yankees. And you guys have been so generous to me. I treasure these. This is a cool page. The story behind that Ozzy Smith card is very cool right there. And then that, that card there I got from David at the bottom, the hockey card where he's got the fly on his, on his forehead. Again, the names are on the back of who sent them to me. In a lot of cases, you can see up top, that's the, the card my buddy Mookie sent me. He's saying, you're Robin, I'm Batman. And he's right. And then I have more sets. This is my 81 and 82 golf set. So um, I put these together years ago. I actually bought a box of the 81 golf cards. And I put together a set. And then I have a bunch of the doubles. But I've, I've always picked those up over time whenever I see them at a good deal. These are in number order. And the way these are actually done is number one on the money list was number one. Number two on the money list was number two. That year, Jack Nicholas, I guess, was number 13 on the list. And then further back, behind the 81 set. So I have the entire set, stars and commons in top loaders. This is the 82 set. Um, they just did these for two years, and there's the big card in the set. That's a Fred Couples rookie card. You can see the back of it there. So I have some of my sets are in binders, and some are in top loaders and boxes like this. So I'm certainly not consistent with how I do it, but that's how I do it. So that's my little oasis. That's my little sanctuary, Adam. Uh, of where, you know, I store my stuff, where I look through my cards, and just kind of what my little area for my card collecting looks like. Again, I have some stuff in binders. I have some stuff in my cases that I didn't even show. You know, I don't have Zion. I have whatever knockoff Zion is, um, as far as my, my cases. You know, I got my one wall case. I try to keep it dark in there, obviously. There's UV you know, protection on the glass and stuff. But, you know, and then I've got some stuff in boxes and top loaders. So I don't know. I have it kind of a little bit of everywhere and a little bit split up. And then I have, you know, some of my more expensive cards are elsewhere kept in the safe. So uh, I didn't even, I didn't even go there with it. But I just showed you kind of the way things are set up and how I keep things organized and, and where I keep my stuff. My, my collection isn't, isn't a ton of cards. What I've tried to do is I've tried to sell off some of my bulk that aren't as meaningful to pick up a little bit uh, more specific cards that really are my style. And so that's kind of what I have. Again, sometime soon, maybe I'll give you guys a closer look at, at some of my safe cards too, as, as well as a little bit a few of those a little bit closer, and then some of the ones that were in my case that I didn't pull out either. So I hope that answered your question. I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way to do it. It's just whatever it is you're comfortable with. And there are other people who do it completely differently than me. And and that's fine too. Uh, again, that's part of the fun is just sorting your cards. And I moved all a bunch of my cards this weekend. I moved from card saver twos to card saver ones. And that was a fun, that was a fun few hours as I was moving them over and looking at them. So 
If you have questions for an upcoming episode, again, please, down in the comments below, just ask. Just type out your question. Um, you know, I've had questions. I didn't get five. I've had weeks. I didn't get five questions. And so I only had four questions. Um, I don't want that to happen. I'd prefer to do five. So if you have one, ask it. I look forward to that. It's always fun to hear what you guys are interested in. And I hope you enjoyed this last, I don't know, 45 minutes or so as I was sharing my thoughts, which that's all they are, my thoughts. Certainly not the right answer, but just my opinion.